So it is my um, great honor to introduce you to the moderator of today's session, Dr. Ha Ne. Uh, so he is professor of epidemiology at Fudan University. Uh, Dr. Ha is an expert on HIV epidemiology, prevention, and healthcare. He is a pioneer in HIV research and practice among men who have sex with men, biomedical interventions to prevent HIV transmission, including early init initiation of combination antiretroviral therapy and pre-exposure prophylaxis in China. Dr. Ha is also the founder of com the Comparative HIV and Aging Research, the chart um, in Taishu chart cohort, which is an ongoing pros prospective longitudinal cohort extensively examining issues on aging related non-communicable uh, morbidities. Currently, uh, he is the vice director of public health division of the Chinese Medical Association, vice chair of Chinese Epidemiological Association and has served as senior consultant to national public health education, promotion and multi-level HIV AIDS campaigns. He has over 300, holy cow, peer reviewed publications. Um, I could only dream of that, including over a hundred research publications in international journals. And um, please read his full bio in your conference program. Thank you so much uh, for being here, you are the absolute perfect person um, to moderate this panel. So thank you, Dean Ha, for joining. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, today, th th this is the final panel for COVID-19. I'm very honored to uh, moderate this panel. And this morning, we will have uh, four speakers uh, from China, Hong Kong and Chile. Uh, now we invite the first uh, speaker, Professor Hong Jie Yu uh, from the School of Public Health of Fudan University. Of uh, the detailed bibliography mm -hmm. of uh, Hong Jie uh, is available in the conference program. But I would like to uh, give a brief uh, introduction uh, of Professor Yu to you. He's a professor of infectious disease uh, in School of Public Health of Fudan University. Uh, but he, he was the former director of the Division for Infectious Disease of China CDC. He has had a number of uh, papers on COVID-19 uh, published on Science, Nature, and Lancet. So the topic uh, is uh, evolving epidemiology and the transmission dynamics of COVID-19 in China, Professor Yu. Okay, thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizer for inviting me to here to share our work regarding COVID-19 epidemiology in China. I just focus on Chinese issues because at the beginning of the outbreak, we have some you know, research work in COVID-19 epidemiology. So my talk includes two parts. The first part about involving epidemiology and the transmission dynamic outside the Hubei province, because we all know the outbreak first recognized in the Wuhan capital of the Hubei province, but we focus on as the spread of the outbreak, how change of the epidemic outside of Hubei province. Second part, we talk about since the disease is human to human transmission. So how about changing contact pattern shape the dynamic of COVID-19 in China? So for first part of work, we would like to answer the following questions to describe the epidemiologic characteristics of COVID-19 outbreak after 15 days recognized in the province outside of the whole way. And uh, to estimate the change of the key time to event intervals, to estimate the re net reproductive number to access whether the strict control measure put in place in China 
have any effect to successful in slowing down transmission. So we collected individual information from official public source on lab confirmed cases reported in Hubei, outside Hubei province in mainland China for the period from January 19th to February 17th. Because as we all know, Chinese government, the local, in, local government announced every COVID-19 cases officially including detailed epidemiologic information. We use the date of the fourth revision of case definition issued on January 27 to divide the whole epidemic period into two time period. The first part from December 24th to January 27th and the second after January 28th because on January 27th, the Chinese government incorporate the mild case definition, for example, the the low uh, influenza like here is respiratory infection into case definition rather than at the very beginning, they just use the severe or pneumonia case definition as surveillance definition. We estimate the trend in demographic characteristics of the cases and uh, key time to event intervals. We use the Bayesian approach to estimate the dynamic of the net reproduction number RT at the provincial level. So this map shows geographic distribution of the COVID-19 cases. Uh, the way all know, the outbreak first started in capital of the Hubei, Wuhan city, and then spread outside of the Hubei in other cities within Hubei province and other provinces outside the Hubei province. This map shows the epidemic curve outside Hubei. We include two part cases according to their infection source. The, the, the dark bar shows that the cases with travel history to Wuhan or Hubei. The light bar shows the local, occurred local transmission occurred in the locally. So this curve shows the cases with a mixed pattern, including both those travel to Wuhan or Hubei and the follows occurred infection locally. And uh, then we analyze the characteristics of COVID-19 cases. First, we focus on the age gr group. And for the period one, for example, less than 18 years old, for example, children, just less than 3%, but increase to the 5% for the second period, 5%. As well as like this phenomenon observed for the elderly above 65 years old, the proportion of the cases increased from 9% in the period one to the 16% for the period two. And uh, for the sexual, just uh, you know, for the first period, the cases focus on the male cases, but for the second period, it's more balanced between male and the female cases. Not surprised for exposure history, more cases with exposure to other lab confirmed cases or those cases with clinical diagnosis criteria, mid clinical diagnosis criteria more detect in the period two. And this table will give us details about the K time to event interval. For example, for the cases, the time from the symptom onset to first healthcare consultation just decreased from the three days in period one to the 1.6 days in the period two as well as for the time from symptom onset to hospital admission, decreased from 4.4 days in the period one to 2.6 days in the period two. This means that the more cases rapidly recognized by the submitted system and admitted hospital for isolation. And then we estimate the incubation period and the source interval. Incorporation period defined as the time from the infection to symptom onset for confirmed COVID-19 cases. Service so interval defined as interval between symptom onset in a primary O index case and the symptom onset in the secondary cases generated by that primary cases. And the mean for incubation period is about 5.2 days and the service interval the mean of the series interval is about 5.1 days. But this demand that this distribution of 
parameters just meet very much. That means the transmission occurred in the peak of the symptom onset period, even before the symptom onset. And then we estimate the RT at the provincial level to assess whether the transmission just have some any you know, effect less than threshold, for example, RT less than one. This map show us three provinces, panel A, Shenzhen city in Guangdong province, panel B, Hunan province, panel C, Shandong province. And we recognize there are difference between different, different provinces, the RT distribution, but by the end of the January, all province, the RT for all province just reduced to less than one. That means the transmission, local transmission not sustained. And this pattern just have, you know, for all province have all same pattern. So in conclusion for the first part, well, our study provides a detailed overview of the change epidemiology and the transmission dynamic of COVID-19 outside outbreak. And the old study suggests a slowing down of COVID-19 outbreak in mainland China, but focus on outside Hubei province again, indicating initial step taken towards interruption of the COVID-19 transmission might have been effective. And the tragedy of the outbreak in China and beyond, we are dependent on the effectiveness control policy and the human behavior change in coming months. So second part regarding the contact pattern. So for this study, we would answer the following questions. But we, although we observed there are small proportion occurred in the children cases, is only difference for regarding age profile of susceptibility for infection and how social distancing alert age specific contact pattern as we all know at the very beginning of outbreak Chinese government take a strict social distance measure in Wuhan and the other place. And how about this factor interact to affect transmission and answer those questions are relevant to choice of the control policy for government and the policy makers around the world, not only for China. So we performed the contact pattern in Wuhan and Shanghai during February 1st to 10th. And the participant in Wuhan were asked to complete a questionnaire to answer the following two part questions. First part, a regular weekday between December 21st to uh, 13th, 2019, just before the outbreak as the baseline. And the second part, the day before the outbreak conducted during February 1st to 10th as the outbreak period contact pattern. But for participant in Shanghai only ask to complete the same question, but only for the outbreak period. Because for the baseline period in Shanghai, we already conducted the same survey in 2017 to 18 follow the same design. A contact defined as either a two-way conversation involving about three words in the physical presence of to an other person or a direct physical contact. So this map show the timeline of contact survey in Wuhan just at the peak of the epidemic. This map show the timeline of contact survey in the in the Shanghai the shadow just the show the contact period also in the peak of the epidemic. So in Wuhan, the average daily number of contact per participant was significantly reduced from 14.6 for the baseline period to only two contact for the outbreak period. The reduction in contact was significant, still significant for all stratification by sex, age group, type of profession, and the household size. A similar reduction was observed in Shanghai from the daily contact. Number of the contact declined from 18.8 to 0.3. So this is contact matrix by age group. For panel A and D just show the baseline period, B and E show the outbreak period, C and F show the difference between baseline and the outbreak period. Not surprised for the baseline period, the contact major focus on the, the children 
during contact during the school, and uh, the the labor age age people contact during the business, and the elderly during the hospital. But during the outbreak, all those the contact metrics concentration just all disappeared, just leaving the contact major focus on within the household. And then we estimate the correlation between the outbreak and the within, hospital, within household contact. And we found both for Wuhan and Shanghai just a strong correlation for the outbreak contact and within household contact. That means the social distance measure taking place in China just post, put all contact restrict within household. And then we analyze the COVID-19 contact tracing data collected from detailed epidemic field investigation conducted by Hunan CDC. Because according to Chinese government investigation and control protocol, all close contact of COVID-19 cases reported were put place under medical observation for 14 days and tested by RT-PCR. And we include age group and the gender of contact, type of the contact, and whether the contact travel to Hubei or Wuhan as regression variables. And we found just the, the susceptibility increase by age group. We put the elderly from 15 years to 64 years old as a reference. For children less than 14 years old, just a, a less susceptibility to coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2 infection. But for elderly above 65 years old, just an increased susceptibility compared to elderly group. And not surprised because the contact restricted within household. So that means for household contact type, just have a, a, a higher susceptibility compared to other contact type, for example, healthcare contact, contact in the transportations. And we have those two parameters. First, we have the contact pattern date. Second, we have susceptibility by age group. And then we can estimate the impact of the interventions are, are not relying on our age specific estimate of susceptibility to infection and the contact pattern. We use the next generation metrics approach to quantify change or not. We develop ISR model to look for any impact for regarding the contact change. So susceptibility interview can become infection after contact infections in the video according to estimate age specific susceptibility to infection. So this map show the, the, the change of the contact pattern on the dynamic for panel A and C, Wuhan, B and D, Shanghai. For the panel A and B, just, you know, we, assume the baseline of the R0 from one to four and look for an change of the outbreak contact to epidemic. And for the outbreak contact pattern, not bring the R0 above threshold, both for, both for Wuhan and Shanghai. So finally, we look, look for only impact for school closure because we collect the baseline data for Shanghai. So we consider two different contact pattern scenarios based on data collected in Shanghai in 2017 to 18, including contact estimate during vacation period and the contact estimated during regular weekend. And for the, those two similar scenario, close, close school closure, both for during school vacation and not contact the school can easily bring the R0 about one, but for epidemic peak, just reduce com compared to outbreak period and also just delay the outbreak a little bit later. So in conclusion for second part, we'll provide evidence that intervention put in place in Shanghai and Wuhan and the resulting change in human behavior, dramatic decrease of daily contact essentially reduce them to household interactions. This then lead to a dramatic reduction of the virus transmission. It will be particularly important to design target strategy for long-term control of the COVID-19 as we all know those 
non-pharmaceutical intervention just uh, caused a huge economic and social impact. For example, for school and the workplace control strategy, along with last large scale testing and the contact tracing. And I should thank my group and the OSC collaborators. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank Professor Yu for this very exciting uh, research. Uh, now we have our next speaker, uh, Professor Matthias Irazova Domingos. Uh, he's an uh, expert on the child adolescent psychiatrist who works for the Ministry of Health of Chile, where he's the director of the Department of Mental Health. He also had worked for the uh, Pan American Health Organization of WHO, and also as a consultant to for UNICEF and UNESCO. Um, the his topic is uh, going about uh, public health policy, uh, public health policy responses to address the mental health consequences of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, evidence from Latin America. Let's welcome Professor uh, Domingos. Thank you very much, Professor He, uh, uh, dear chairman, and uh, I would like to also um, congratulate Fudan University and University of Southern California uh, for this uh, great conference, especially uh, Melissa Withers. I will talk today about uh, public policy responses to address the mental health consequences of a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I will, I will try to focus on Latin America, but also with a, a global perspective. So the first case of COVID-19 in the Americas was confirmed in the USA on January 2020, and Brazil reported the first case for Latin America and the Caribbean on February 26th. Since then, COVID-19 has spread to all, all the Americas. Strong and technical help was needed, and the World Health Organization activated regional and country incident management system teams. And with the collaboration of the Mental Health and Substance Use Department, provided direct emergency response and disseminated based technical documents to help guide countries' mental health strategies and policies to manage this pandemic. Despite the effort, the region of the Americas accounts for the majority of new COVID-19 deaths worldwide. In, a, in countries in the region, reported the response is national COVID response plans. However, only 17% of these countries has ensured full additional funding for mental health covering all activities. Two thirds, 65% of responding countries have a multi sector for COVID 19 response. And more than 65% of these countries included the ministries of health, social, family affairs, and education, and also non governmental organizations as part of these platforms. Almost half, 51% of responding countries reported that ensuring the continuity of all mental health services was included in the list of essential health services in the national 19 response plans. While all, only 40% of countries reported the inclusion of some mental health services in the list of the essential health services in the national response plan. No country uh, in the region reported a full closure of all services, but only 7% of responding countries were services fully open with 93% of countries reported disruptions in one or four of their services for mental health disorders. There were differences in the type of services affected by closure, with outpatient services in mental health and general hospitals, as well as community-based service predominantly more affected. For example, community-based services were more impacted compared with inpatient facilities, with full or partial closure in more than 40 countries in the region, and home care and daycare services reaching levels of full or partial closure in 60 or 70% of the countries. 
Countries were also asked to report on disruption of delivery of specific mental health interventions, and one third of responding countries reported complete or partial, partial disruption across at least 75% of specific mental health related intervention services. This level of disruption was the highest within countries in the community transmission stage of COVID-19. An important finding is that some life-saving emergency and essential mental health services were reported as being disrupted. 35% of countries reported some disruption of management of emergency mental health manifestations, and one third reported disruption in supply of medication for people with mental health disorders. Many countries in the Americas can and have already dealt with the health impact of small or medium-sized emergency situations using local resources and staff. However, major impact disaster as the pandemic completely overwhelmed the affected country's capacity to respond. Worse yet, when a pandemic occurs simultaneously in several countries, it limits the capacity of any one country to, to respond to its own needs, let alone to assist its neighbors. We also know that in emergency, people are affected in different ways and require different kinds of support. A key to organizing mental health and psychosocial support is to develop a layer system of complementary support that meets the need of different groups. This may be illustrated by a well-known intervention pyramid in which all layers are important and should ideally be implemented concurrently. The problem in Chile and many other countries in the region is that instead of building local capacities, supporting self-help and strengthening the resources already present, during the first months of the pandemic, we focused mainly on the specialized COVID-19 hospital beds. The years behind the history of earthquakes intersectoral action. When the COVID-19 pandemic was posing significant health, lifestyle, and economic challenges for Chileans and the region, and evidence showed that there was likely to be a significant negative mental health impact as a result, the attention of the politicians and the president was rise to reduce the of COVID but one that required a lot of work and joint effort. A national commission was constituted and academic institutions, scientific societies, civil society, and parliamentarians were nimble in responding to the increasing support needs in six areas. Strengthening health system, strengthening community mental health, risk communication, workplace alcohol and substance use prevention, and mental well-being support services. Partnership and collaboration are key at the use of resources and coordination, an integrated approach to social and emotional well-being that acknowledged the complex context of mental wellness and the role of social determinants was included. As a result of this great collaborative work, mental health actions were finally considered essential components of the national response to COVID-19, and mental health and psychosocial support has been increasingly available in the emergency. But not the good question about COVID-19 is that promote mental health and social being. Also, with live experience were not invited from the beginning to participate in the advisory group. Although it seems difficult to understand, especially with the motto of the World Mental Health Day of this year, extra budget was not considered from the beginning. But thanks to the Commission's work, a five times increase in mental health budget was approved for the next year. More than 10 countries in America has included mental health services and as an essential part of government responses to COVID-19. Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Ecuador, Mexico, many others. So it's not necessary to have a presidential initiative to address the mental health dimension of this pandemic. But when governments, civil society, health authorities, and others come together 
to address the mental health dimension of this pandemic, it's easier to transform mental health services, shift more mental health services to the community. So the mid and long-term health, economic and social consequences due to COVID-19 pandemic are expected to have a lasting and negative effect on mental health, especially amongst a vulnerable population. This disadvantageous scenario, nonetheless, may also provide an opportunity for bolstering mental health reform in the region, as seen in, in other countries and regions of the world. Humanitarian emergencies, such as natural disasters and global pandemics, have been previously described as fertile grounds to create and reorganize mental health services. Often it takes a disaster to get mental health on the agenda. Crisis situations have been seen as an opportunity to change traditional mental health care and build more person-centered system of care and to mobilize, meet attention and make mental health a public health priority. Although we are grateful that several governments and agencies from Latin America and elsewhere have started to recognize the negative effects of the pandemic on mental health among the general population, I strongly believe that more can be and should be done for those living with mental disorders. So I'm going to give some, some last key messages. And, and, and one, the, the first one is that the, the incredible response is leaving some people behind. A tremendous rapid and innovative response has been mounted to meet the needs of the general population by disseminating wellness information and quickly to virtual services and support. But these offerings are not meeting the needs of some key vulnerable populations an opportunity exists to prepare and transform the system. The most significant impact on mental health, substance use, and service systems are likely to be felt in the aftermath of the pandemic. Planning should begin now, including meaningful engagement with service users so that the post-pandemic system incorporates innovation while not abandoning the transformation underway before COVID-19. Focusing on health and mental health care providers is key. Supporting and building on the mental health supports offered to frontline healthcare providers and identifying the mental health requirements of mental health professionals are key also to, men, to meeting their needs during and after the crisis. Focus attention on workforce planning for, planning for the post-pandemic period is also necessary to better align workforce capacity with the mental health needs of the population. The mental health impact are delayed, complex, and long-term. The lessons learned international from COVID-19 and from earlier disaster and epidemics suggest that planning and reforms are important for staying ahead of mental health impact that will be long-term, complex, and may take time to fully emerge. Foster resilience is important. Anticipating the increased prevalence of mental health problems and illnesses due to COVID-19 must be balanced against the risk of pathologizing emotional responses to an unprecedented and highly stressful situation. Mental services and intervention that support meaning, making, and post-traumatic growth and resilience will need to be available early to buffer and protect the psychological health of people in different regions of the world. Much about the virus remains unknown, but one basic fact is clear. The world was not prepared. The pandemic has revealed inadequate health systems, important gaps in social protection, and major structural inequalities within and between countries. We must all draw the hard lessons of this crisis. One of those lessons is that underinvestment in health can have a devastating impact on social societies and economies. The pandemic is causing the global four hundred months some 500 million and development is going into reverse for the first time since the 1990s. And I think has shown that universal health coverage is strongly emergency preparedness as communities to economies and to everyone. At least half the world's people do not have access to health services they need. Some 100 million people are driven into poverty each year by catastrophic health care costs. This huge gap in health coverage is one reason why COVID-19 has caused so much pain 
and suffering. Universal health coverage requires government to step up investment in common good health in they will never face faces such a situation again. It also requires public health programs to be inclusive um, and equitable barriers. And health treatment should health coverage, including mental health coverage now to strengthen efforts against the pandemic and prepare for future crises. We must turn preparedness, and that means involving all sectors of society and investment in alert systems that trigger action by health uh, authorities. Um, this is uh, the price uh, is cheap but when uh, that uh, um, we know that universal health coverage comes at a cost, but the price is cheap. We, we consider the alternative. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Han. Our next uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Martin Wong. He is uh, Associate Director and the General Affairs of the School of Public Health of, uh, and uh, Primary Care of Faculty of Medicine, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he is a specialist in family medicine and a researcher in the field of cancer screening and the prevention of chronic diseases. And he is also conferred as an honorary fellow by the Hong Kong Academy of Nursing to recognize his achievement in profession. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, global challenges of managing uh, NCDs during the COVID-19 pandemic, please. Thank you very much, Chairman uh, Dean Nahi. And also uh, I would like to actually express my very sincere gratitude to Professor uh, Melissa Withers for your very kind uh, in, uh, invitation for me to have a, the opportunity to present this uh, uh, series of uh, slides. So when we talk about NCDs and non-communicable diseases, we understand that we are really facing a real global challenge, which is unprecedented. So this diagram is really just to have a snapshot on the um, figures of non-communicable diseases. It actually constitutes 70% of all deaths globally. And a yearly number of deaths actually exceeded 14 million people who, uh, who died between the years of 30 to 70 years. And however, most of the premature deaths in fact could have been prevented or delayed. And now we can see the total annual number of deaths from NCD will increase to 55 million by 2030 if what we call the business as unusual um, continues. So now we are in an era of business as unusual under the, the new ecosystem of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are very, very unsure about um, the impact of COVID-19 on care of NCDs. So this slide is really just to summarize that percentage of death attributable to NCDs. As we can see here, in the high income countries, more developed regions, they got a high proportion of total deaths, which are attributable to NCDs. It's up to 87 to 89% uh, in the year 2030, where uh, they actually contributed almost 90% of all the deaths. So um, with the increasing challenges of population aging, rise in multimorbidity, that means having chronic diseases, uh, at least two or more chronic diseases, longer life expectancies and increasing survival rates. Now we just captured some data from Hong Kong. The life expectancies of our uh, Hong Kong population is really talking about 81 to 82 years on average uh, for men and 87% for women. So um, this life expectancy has been estimated to perhaps in, uh, increase in the future uh, at around 90 or even 92 years in 2060. So we're really worried about the increase in NCDs and its associated global burden. 
Now, of course, needless to say, we all understand the global burden of coronavirus from our previous speaker, uh, Professor Yu, and also uh, Professor uh, Matthias. So it's really just to talk about and highlight that we've got millions of deaths and also uh, 38 million of confirmed cases uh, by 15 October. So uh, the world map well, is actually a very upset picture because we, uh, it seems that we need to really do something before it's spreading uh, even further. Uh, apart from the global burden, it's also important for us to actually realize that uh, for COVID-19, we do have accumulated figures reported by the World Health Organization. And interestingly, the, uh, there has been even distribution of infections between men and women. But the highest percentage of cases uh, were in the 25 to 39 uh, years age group. And we understand the crude mortality rate is really talk about 3% to 4%, but then the mortality weight increase with age and around 75 of the deaths, they are from uh, people age 65 years or above. So um, I wish to share with you one uh, literature source, uh, which I like uh, very much is actually conducted by the World Health Organization. Uh, it's the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on NCD resources and services. I highly recommend our audience to read the whole document because it's actually very informative and gives very essential pieces of information. I uh, like the, the report today. So I extracted some information which is we really talking about um, that particular document's findings. So um, at least there are two very important impacts of COVID-19 on NCDs. For instance, people living with NCDs are, are, are higher uh, risk from contracting COVID-19, especially those age over 60 years and living with NCDs. So this therefore will induce higher risk of becoming severely ill or dying from the virus. And also it may impose challenges for those living alone. And also secondly, we may have disruption of the services for prevention and treatment of NCDs. For instance, we may have long-term upsurge in deaths from NCDs, and then there may be delays in terms of their prevention, including screening, including making proper diagnoses, and also offering essential and timely treatment for NCDs. So therefore, um, when we're talking about the business as unusual, the WHO has actually in fact identified some of the very important challenges. Now, because of the limitation of time, I'm only able to address some of them. Now, the first one is underinvestment. So it's related to resources in terms of prevention, early diagnosis, screening and treatment. And also the momentum of progress in curbing NCD epidemic is also a particular concern we can see a very significant disruption of services for NCD patients. So this would actually induce long-term upsurge in deaths from NCDs, uh, making it more likely. And since the outbreak, people with the NCDs, they're in fact more vulnerable to become severely ill or in fact died uh, from COVID-19. So therefore, are we under-investing in NCD management? Are we doing good enough? So this is actually a very important question because policymakers might probably like to reflect, has there been uh, adequate resources for NCD services, which make it even more sustainable uh, during the epidemic of COVID-19? Now, the underinvestment in prevention, early diagnosis, screening, screening, treatment, and rehabilitation has been highlighted by the WHO talking about 43% of the interviewed countries, they have postponed screening programs. So as we understand screening programs, they represent very important uh, preventive measures as a form of secondary preventive strategy. There are, however, therefore, decrease in the number of people diagnosed with NCDs during this pandemic, but it doesn't mean it's good news because the delay in diagnosis would cause later stage diagnosis placing an even heavier burden and pressure on our healthcare system later on. And in the 2019, health systems were unable to fully respond in most countries 
to the healthcare needs of people with NCDs. Now, uh, the, on the lower left-hand side, the box there, I will just some of the figures showing that only uh, a minority of the countries, they are providing drug therapy, counseling services, palliative care and guidelines for management and also prevention of NCDs. So this is actually another source of concern and challenge. So uh, this slide is really just to summarize some of the budgetary issues and resources from public health perspective. As you can see here, some, uh, a large proportion of the countries being surveyed, they've got NCD staff being assigned to COVID-19 response. But as we can see here, uh, only some or even in fact, all NCD staff were partially assigned. And therefore, we have to realize that this particular figures, 36%, 32%, they are not small. They actually represent significant proportion of the NCD staff being partially reassigned to um, COVID-19 responses. And as a result, there's been, uh, perhaps we would actually speculate under manpower of um, people who handle NCDs in their daily practice. Now this figure is really just to show the countries with NCD budget assigned to COVID-19 response efforts. So if, if there, for no funding being reassigned is up to 61%, whereas for 36%, we are not really sure. So therefore 61% of the budget for NCD has been reassigned to COVID-19 response efforts. So therefore we have to rethink, do we have actually enough budget to handle NCDs? Okay, so uh, this is actually a very big topic, disruption of services for the prevention and treatment of NCDs. So um, as the question actually really asks, which of the following services have, have been disrupted the most significantly? And as we, we can see here, Yes, I think you are correct then. Congratulations in your uh, poor results. In fact, rehabilitation services have been affected the most, followed by hypertension management, diabetes, complication management, and asthma, et cetera, et cetera, and et cetera. And uh, this uh, diagram is actually corroborated by in fact that uh, many people often misinterpret rehabilitation as non-essential service. So therefore a key to healthy recovery following severe illness from COVID-19 and in NCD care rehabilitation following stroke, they might probably be a little bit compromised because of the budget reallocation. So there are a lot of consequences associated with it like prolonged morbidity or mortality, future increased need, including longer inpatient stays, and also avoidable hostile admissions because of late presentation of chronic diseases or their care being less optimal than before. And as a result, our healthcare costs increased uh, overall. So we have the patient, why uh, should we actually focus on it? Because, uh, well, uh, because of the uh, mis interpretation of its um, uh, essential function. So some people actually really thought that it's non-essential and hence the WHO has a recommendation. So we need to, in fact, when the rehabilitation services are temporarily ceased, decreased or diverted, we need to really identify priority patients who should continue rehabilitation. Okay, so we have some of the priority groups here like surgery, stroke, cardiovascular emergencies and those presented with multimorbidity. So therefore, the WHO is also recommending the use of tele-rehabilitation services, such as online consultation, such as teaching of exercise programs by physio and occupational therapists over uh, the internet. So the more severe the transmission phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, the most likely are the services being disrupted. As we can see here in the sp for sporadic clusters, or community. Phase four had the highest proportion of countries having the NCDs being partially disrupted or severely disrupted here. So uh, no matter for hypertension, diabetes, cancer, or cardiovascular services, the major NCDs, we're really concerned about the disruption of services. 
And also, what are the causes of disruption? In fact, it is actually attributable to decrease in inpatient volume due to cancellation of elective cases, followed by closure of population level screening programs or others like government or public transport lockdowns, hindering access to health facilities. So the NCD services included in the list of essential health services of countries COVID-19 response plan. We can see here uh, for the proportion of countries uh, with COVID-19 plans, including NCDs, cardiovascular disease, diabetes surface and cancer surfaces are among the top priorities and a larger, having the largest proportion. So what are the approaches used to overcome COVID-19 related disruptions? We can see here uh, some of the countries that use telemedicine to replace person-to-person -person contact. They have task shifting or road delegation being one of the solutions and also novel supply chain or and triaging to identify the different priorities. And among which, in fact, the most popular one worldwide is to, triage, to have the triaging, to identify priorities and also patients who should receive care in the first place. So a lot of people are actually living with NCDs are having high risk. As you can see actually from this table, the most common comorbidities observed in uh, COVID-19 positive disease patients, the majority are having ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and chronic renal failure. So as the number of uh, comorbidities increase, as we can see it, there, there are, is actually an increase in proportion of people having, if they have multi-morbidity, they are actually I mean, more commonly observed in COVID-19 uh, positive disease patients. So this last uh, few slides is really just to show that all around the world, we've got a number of morbid patients that are suffering from uh, COVID-19 uh, risk. And therefore, what next? The last slide is really just to say that we need to have more intensive discussion by more emphasis on NCD services, having heavier governmental commitment to mitigate the impact of NCDs. And also we have the NCD Alliance principles, uh, which involves leadership and community engagement, et cetera. And this will require your inputs. Uh, so that is actually a discussion item left to be further discussed. So with that, I have to say thank you. We still have targets by 2025 in Hong Kong, talking about nine targets to combat the NCDs and also to control the different risk factors. So with that, I wish to thank you, uh, APRU, Fudan University, especially Dean Chairman Nahi, and also Professor Melissa Withers. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you. Now we have our next speaker, uh, Professor Emily Chan, uh, Associate Dean the Faculty of Medicine of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, she's uh, also a co-chairperson of the WHO thematic platform for health emergency and disaster risk management research network and the WHO COVID-19 research roadmap, a social science and working group. He, she's going to talk about what do we know about home care in COVID-19 in Asia metropolis, the case of Hong Kong? Let's welcome Professor Emily Chen. Good morning. This is Professor Emily Chen of Chinese University of Hong Kong. Today, I wish to share with you the characteristics and well-being of urban informal healthcare provider during COVID-19 pandemic, which is a piece of research that my team has put together in order to understand what's going on with our community or with an urban-based community as we got to the search capacity of the use of informal healthcare providers. COVID-19 pandemic, as my fellow speaker has explained, is one of the coronavirus family members similar to SARS and MERS. It was considered by WHO in 2020 January as the public health emergency of international concern. As of October this month, more than a million deaths were reported globally. It constitutes to an important health threat 
and it definitely overwhelms the national healthcare system globally. This is just a quick snapshot about the cases or the status of the pandemic by the first week of October. And what we can tell is that Asia is in a different phase of the pandemic when compared with South America and, and South America as a continent. And for that good reason, we believe we may have some experience to share as what we have seen by um, the type of system, the type of policies we have implemented to, come to the community. The reason why we picked home care is because a lot of communities assume that home care or care that was provided by informal care provider would be able to support the overwhelmed national health system. And we have good reason to believe that this is currently the largest um, surge capacity being harnessed around the world. But what's happening in an urban context? And we believe Hong Kong as a city in South China will be able to, sh to show you that the evidence found in the community will be able to use to exhibit what's going on. To start, this is actually the epidemic curve of Hong Kong. Um, since the start of the, um, the outbreak, in January, we are at our third wave. And Hong Kong residents has a number of experience with infectious disease outbreak with SARS, avian flu. So as a community, there are memory within its residents about I mean, the various public health measures and about how to cope with um, extreme infectious disease I mean, events. And with the pandemic, it's quite an interesting um, opportunity for us, again, to revisit how home care are organized and who are the providers, who are the recipients. At least in, on literature, informal home care providers usually refers to family members or others who provide unpaid care to those in need. And it was assumed that the profile of individuals who require home cares are people who usually are dependent with chronic diseases, mental health conditions, disability, the extreme of age. But essentially, is that true? And do we actually know anything more than just a general scope of um, understanding of the providers and all the recipient in the community? So for this particular study, its aim is to identify the pattern of informal care, the characteristics of both the care provider and the recipient, and hopefully be able to discuss and identify challenges so that policymakers may be able to bridge capacity that may support the protection of people in the affected world. This is a cross-sectional population-based telephone survey based on computerized random digit dialing. And like many typical telephone surveys, we recruit patients or we recruit participants uh, with hopefully a representational sample that is according to the distribution of the local population on age, gender, and district. And we try to collect information about subjects' perception, knowledge of um, home care, and also the experience during pandemic. And it is important for me to also highlight as a, as a sample, as we collect the data, um, the sample, we have a 44% response rate. I mean, we found the sample to be comparable to the population data for the Hong Kong by census um, information in 2016. So at least our results is in general comparable to the patterns of um, the Hong Kong population. There are a few key findings. In view of time, I will select a number that's relevant to the discussion. First, from the study of um, 765 um, final study sample, we realized that about 25% of the respondents or the households provide informal home care during the period. And we are talking about the time during the first six weeks of the pandemic. Among the recipient, 55.3% of the home care recipients are children, and most of um, the dependent care recipients are in both extreme of age. So they could be young, they could be old. And uh, in terms of the characteristics of the informal home care provider, a number of them told us that they reported additional mental strain, actually more than 50% of them. And 37.2% report challenges in daily living during COVID-19 because, I mean, they have to take care of um, receive care recipient. And for many 
people who are actually taking up the duty as providers, they also have to take personal leave from school, from work, which present them with difficulty in maintaining of their regular lives. Of note, I think it's important to highlight 54.2% of these care providers need to take care of two or more family members. So they have heavy burden. And the other um, findings through the multivari multivariable logistic regression indicates that these providers tend to be younger adults, female of gen uh, gender, married, housewife, and they are more likely also to um, support multiple people needs. And among the informal home care provider, 18.4% respondent took leave from school and work to provide care that includes people for older individuals and children. And people are, so normally what's happened, because many of the facilities like the daycare center, the nursery is available in regular times, but in COVID-19, when there is a community lockdown, all those um, facilities were closed. So the care, I mean, responsibility goes back to the household. So as a result, there's about 18.4% of respondents has to take leave from their regular work school duties to be home. And of note also from our findings, we realized that 63.1% of care providers are economic active. So naturally that shows that I mean, a significant proportion of the community during COVID-19 faced double burden of both working and provide primary care for their, for their members. So what are the key points? If we believe that population-wide public health emergency Home care may be the only care options for people in contexts, general as Hong Kong or in low income and um, resource constrained setting, where the care option is probably the only option. 25% of general population did took up informal care responsibility. And if we want to go further to understand who may be the care recipients, the care recipients may range from people who are healthy, but they are dependent, such as infant, young school children, older individuals, to unhealthy but dependent individuals who actually have regular health maintenance support needs, to patients with chronic diseases, and people who need supplementary care. Then, after these two groups, till the point that policy always focus on suspected and confirmed COVID-19 cases, which requires actually infection control knowledge, patient management, skills and treatment to support people. So we have a diversity of care recipients in the community versus what, I mean, national governments may actually highlight that all oh, the suspected or confirmed case should be managed, but we actually have more than just suspected and confirmed case that needs service and care. How about for the care providers? I think the biggest assumption or the wrong assumption was that people assume there is a standard home care context where people can provide care. In fact, 34.8% of our respondents reported that there is capacity limitation to conform in the household to infection control standard. It's like people living in Hong Kong where the space is small, they won't be able to, um, to follow the advice of keeping certain distance that is safe for uh, social distancing from potential suspected individuals. And in addition, for informal care providers, there are all these assumptions that the providers will, pro will process the appropriate level of health literacy. And in fact, in our studies, we actually discovered that 49.5% of our respondents feel they are inadequately prepared to cope with additional health risk. And 11% actually reported that they feel inadequate in their knowledge level to even provide regular healthcare duties because they are not the ones who provide regular duties, but there's no support, there's no guidance, or there's no um, resources available for them to learn what to do. And the next level is actually even resources, because, I mean, think about, I mean, the economic pressure which the providers were under, especially if they're working. And uh, I mentioned during uh, earlier that there are at least 18.4% of the individuals has to report they have to take leave from work and school to manage um, the patients. And 9.1% of the household also report they have less than one week of supplies of NCD, your non communicable disease um, um, drugs, and management uh, um, equipment or resources. 
So there are a lot of things in the community, but um, with that, with the findings, we actually, I mean, have facilitated the development of an updated community guidelines that facilitate home care. And for that as well, we were also pushing for update of home care guidance because WHO has come up with a good guidance in March 2020 during the time when we have um, when we were doing our studies, but only very limited respondents are aware of such guidelines. In local context, there are general guidelines for infection control at home, but home care guidelines were almost close to none. So as a result, the findings actually facilitate several reports generation from, I mean, capacity to the UN to Landsat and as a research outcome. And through discussion as a case, we managed to convince with a group of global interested researchers uh, that the WHO to update its uh, interim guidelines to the August uh, 12 version that I would encourage uh, interested members of um, this conference to look at because, I mean, it did include um, the gaps in the discussion and the cases that have come around the world about what's happened to informal home care during the time. So as a conclusion, the study, this small study, at least able to come up with a description a profile of care recipients and informal care provider during the early phase of COVID-19 in the urban context in Asia. We are very eager to follow up and to understand what's happened during now, because this study was done six months ago, with time, with fatigue, with the social measures, and with a lot of um, important evolution. Does the experience of home care for provider changes with time? I mean, does home care providers in other urban contexts have different experience that work well for us to think about? And whether there are evidence-based, effective knowledge and skills gap bridging programs that can help the needs. But essentially, our argument is that government should consider reviewing and supplement relevant support to facilitate informal home care for people in need during large-scale public health emergencies, because we believe of such studies or such focus will be useful to prepare the community for future large-scale emergencies. Thank you. Um, thank you, Emily, uh, for this uh, very important topic. So now we, today, uh, we have uh, four speakers. Uh, Professor Yu uh, talked about the epidemiology dynamics in the early pandemic, uh, early epidemic in China, and also uh, how the change of the social contact patterns impacted on the epidemic. Professor uh, Domingers uh, raised the important concerns of mental health related to COVID-19. Uh, Professor Martin Chen called on attention to NCDs uh, and also related to healthcare in this uh, important issue. Uh, Professor Emily Chen uh, just uh, talked about uh, home care and challenges uh, during the uh, epidemic, especially the informal uh, home care providers. And uh, now we, we do have uh, many uh, questions uh, and also uh, encourage participants to, to ask questions. So now I would like to invite uh, Professor Yu uh, Dr. Uh, Domingers, Professor Wong, uh, and uh, to uh, uh, to show and answer take the questions. I the first question. Um, first question goes to uh, Professor Yu. Uh, in your opinion, why some countries are experiencing a fresh spike in COVID-19 cases in the second wave. Okay, thank you for your question. My team also conducted a study with a systematic review and a meta-analysis meta -analysis for serological evidence among general population across the world. We analyzed the seroprevalence for the general population by WHO region. We found that even with intensive transmission in the European region and the American region, so the serial prevalence of the general population just the highest, just up to less than 
is around uh, seven to nine percent. So that means for most of the population in the world are still susceptible to uh, SARS coronavirus two. That means once the virus introduction again, so since the most of the population is still susceptible to the virus, that should raise uh, epidemic again. And we also know there are plenty of the scientific evidence to prove non-pharmaceutical intervention have effective to control the epidemic. And uh, we still have no vaccination available for the <clears throat> population. So that means if a country like China implement the non-pharmaceutical intervention effective in the population that should can stop the second wave of the epidemic. And we all know from Chinese lessons and the experience, we implement strict case early detection, case isolation, and uh, contact tracing or for close contact for medical observation, and also RT-PCR test for all close contact and uh, also some social distance measure, for example, school closure and close business. And also even shut down a city like Wuhan, you know, stop the public transportation and the loss restriction of the travel outside the city, outbreak city and also outside China. So those non-pharmaceutical intervention proved effective to stop the transmission. The country, for example, not taking those non-pharmaceutical intervention in place and monitor the any impact of the those non-pharmaceutical intervention. I believe there will be a second wave again, and also in the coming winter season, there may be have more bigger epidemic for COVID nineteen in the those countries. So that's all. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, our professor. Now the next question. Uh, goes to our uh, Professor Domingos. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your excellent lecture. According to what presented, you consider that strategies such as primary health care are an opportunity to achieve a comprehensive attention, especially in mental health, would have any difference between countries of high income, middle income, and low income. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we all know that COVID-19 pandemic uh, has disrupted the delivery of mental health services globally, but we also know that the particularly lower middle income countries has, has been much more harder um, where the substantial demands on mental health care has imposed the, the, the pandemic are intersecting with the, the already fragile and fragmented care systems. And so so it, it, it was a problem before the pandemic. So, so I think there are two successful global mental health strategies that can be relevant for mental health services in the context of COVID-19. One of them is, a, is the task shifting, the use of trained laid lay health workers to deliver health care in non-specialist settings. Thus shifting has led to success in many innovative mental health services. There, there is a difficult implementation challenges, but still a good in terms of implementation building countries. And in COVID highlights the need to re-examine task shifting. And so, so to, in the task shifting in, in COVID-19, especially mental health. So in order to, to, to have more information to know if the implementation can improve the access and reach of mental health services, that, that's a, a very important question now that uh, we are having in many countries. The second strategy is the use of digital health technology to strengthen a health system. 
Uh, we all know that, and, and, and we're doing the conference in, in, in that way, widespread adoption of mobile phones and, and uh, can be important in, in low and middle income countries. And that has led to the increasing use of health interventions. So we're still gathering evidence supporting large scale adoption of virtual intervention for mental health care in low and middle income countries. But in high income countries, we know that there are a lot of digital innovations and the COVID-19 uh, has led to increasing global adoption of virtual care to reduce the risk of infection among health and the rest of the population. Uh, so this, despite the several questions surrounding digital innovation, um, even in high income countries, the potential to increase the access and coverage in hard to reach areas can be very, very important uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of reaching and also effectiveness um, and can be also used in low and middle income countries. And, and mobile phones can assist the delivery of quality services for facilitating this, the access to train also to supervision, to support among care providers. So, so not only for patients, but also among care providers. So, so I think we have some opportunities uh, in different settings um, uh, in different countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Professor Martin. Um, is the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the NCDs uh, health services is long-term. Uh, what measures as has been put in place to uh, catch this effect? Thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, Hena. And then uh, in fact, this, I think it's actually an excellent question because it uh, has the, a major a significance and importance on our future running of the healthcare system. One thing I'm uh, considering is firstly, uh, the building up of the primary healthcare system in our community. That's actually, uh, well, very difficult to actually change our healthcare system uh, overnight. So there have been some scholars suggesting that improvement of self-care practices could represent a partial solution in countries where primary healthcare system has not yet been uh, too robust or is uh, actually developing. So number one, uh, teaching um, individuals with skills, knowledge on health education and also on their uh, coping strategies to the uh, pandemic will be extremely important. And secondly, I think the government and policymakers could really consider interdisciplinary, or sometimes we call transdisciplinary, intersectoral -sector collaboration, where the community clinics and hospitals can really work together to fight against uh, the pandemic by forming a team where the team can actually manage patients' different needs. Because in COVID-19, we can see a lot of people having multi-morbidity. They require multiple visits to multiple healthcare providers. So it's actually really important for uh, the whole team consisting of different professionals to help the patients at, at, at a single time point, preferably, or uh, with less consultation um, frequency being paid. So I do think it's really important for the policymakers to certainly consider um, containment strategies at times where the pandemic is increasing, using a very flexible approach and trying to identify uh, priority groups for screening and also for testing of the COVID-19. And lastly, and uh, needless to say, in the future, we have to understand this is a new ecosystem, which might probably last for two or even more years, as from some of the scholars. We have to be prepared for that pandemic and need to actually, actually educate our patients and our citizens. And the government will need to think about future purchase of the COVID-19 vaccine and the other important preventive measures to combat this pandemic. So uh, I think it's a very short answer. Uh, if I were given more time, it would be very, it could be uh, very very long, uh, but I do think our collaboration and further discussion will be very important uh, to help combat the pandemic's consequence. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next question is also uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Domingos. Uh, despite the fact that the pandemic showed the importance of mental health. 
it still remains as a stigma in several places, and many people don't find it important. How to approach this in a scenario where more mental problems are most likely to emerge at the impact of the pandemic? Uh, this is a question from Mexico, and greetings for you. Saludos a Mexico, greetings to Mexico. And uh, it's a great question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, stigma is, is an annoying social, social force, hmm, which is associated with a, a multitude of traits, conditions, and social groups. Mental health is, is not the only one. Hmm. An explanation for mental health stigmatization include the so social situation, which suggests people become classified as undesirable due to possessing a certain attribute or, or showing certain behaviors. And that's very common with mental disorders. But in turn, this attitude leads to, to generalize stigma towards a, a subsection of society. Uh, and in this case, uh, people um, with, uh, with mental disorders and and on the other hand, with COVID, can, can be a double stigma. Um, so stigma and fear of stigma are very important. Uh, and in some regions in the world, for example, Eastern cultures, cultures can be uh, 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 dramatically important in terms of access to services. Because some, in some cultures, issues such as misconceptions and, and labelings of patients, the use of words with ne negative con connotations, the spread of misinformation, the misinterpretation of on social networks, and, and, and sometimes the use of terms that make people feel guilty can be very common. And that can be also applied to, to Latin America. So mental health stigma as a result of COVID-19 causes people with mental disorders to hide early symptoms of the disease and not seek healthcare because of fear of discriminatory behavior. They, they have already uh, felt this discrimination. Thus, this stigma leads to the reluctance of patients with mental disorder to undergo tests, not seeking uh, um, healthcare services, not commitment to treatment, and no disclosure of diseases sometimes. So the evidence clearly show the stigma and fear of communicable diseases prevent responding to the disease. So, in, in, and, and in some other groups, for example, elderly people, older people with mental disorders can, can lead to people in the community being less likely to have contact with older people. And we have, we have, we have seen that in, in many countries. So the, the, the message is that to prevent and control the coronavirus, it is important to pay attention to COVID-19 related mental health stigma, especially among people with mental disorders and that many times uh, in some groups, for example, older people, but some other um, uh, discriminated groups, like, for example, migrants. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a very important topic. Thank you for the question. Oh, thank you. Um, the next question is also for uh, Professor Wong. Uh, thank you for the topic. What would you suggest on planning the budget and the medical services on NCDs nationally in case of the pandemic, be both uh, effective and economic? Thank you very much. Uh, I do, I think this question is an excellent one, uh, but also very challenging as well, because uh, for budgetary uh, planning, it really depends on the community needs. So therefore in a number of countries, um, they have actually had projection of community needs in terms of, the, of their medical and social services. And from these calculations and estimations, they will try to allocate resources to NCDs. But uh, in terms of NCD services, prevention and screening, but in fact, um, this is actually a little bit difficult to answer because I, I'll give you an example. Like if I talk about screening for NCDs, people can't simply go to the clinics for screening. So even if there has been a budget being um, allocated for screening service or preventive services like health talks, health education, if that can't be carried out, it will be uh, extremely difficult for the government to uh, actually uh, commit a certain amount of budget to these services. And as a result, uh, we have to have contingencies. And I highly recommend a health economist and also the other healthcare policymakers to sit down together 
and think uh, the firstly is actually to think about the priority groups. So therefore the budget, I, I think is actually really limited for a number of countries. We have to prioritize uh, patients and also people in need so that they can actually receive the resources. And secondly, we have to think about essential services. So when we are talking about rehabilitation services and services for people with cardiovascular disease and stroke, they might represent people who really need the, uh, the resources urgently. So we need to actually identify those people there and also identify what healthcare professionals are currently facing. So we need to have actually extra research and studies to ascertain the amount of um, uh, or the necessity of additional funding to hospitals and clinics. And lastly is the um, I mean, consideration of the community needs. So we do need to actually sit together to estimate the budgetary uh, estimation and also uh, have a very frank dialogue with the government and see how the government uh, probably will uh, suggest. We do think this continuous communication and uh, well, and at the same time, it's not a one-off exercise. It must be continuous over time. Therefore, regular surveillance and monitoring of the NCB situations would therefore be extra important because uh, we understand if the budget has been, say, for this month has been dedicated to a particular service, if there are remaining gaps, we need to have continuous evaluation and assessment of the needs, which could be changing over time. So thanks a lot for this excellent question. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, our last question asks for Professor Yu. Does the epidemic or the resources of the epidemic depend on each country's control strategies, people's susceptibility, and or virus virulence? Ask my opinions. Right. I don't think uh, actually I believe led by WHO, every country implement a uh, virological surveillance to monitor only, you know, change for various, you know, mutation. And according to my knowledge to date, there are no major, you know, mutation for the virus cause the, you know, any, you know, virulence or clinical severity change, you know, for human people. So. I do think uh, the big occurrence of the uh, epidemic just depend on the, the, the immunity among the people. So as my said before, according to my team conduct a global systematic review and analysis, meta-analysis regarding zero prevalence among general population. So there are huge variation across the world. For example, that like country in China, the zero prevalence among general population, even in only city with intensive community transmission in Wuhan, just the zero prevalence is less than 1% among general population. And the highest we observed in the United States, there are still a huge variation across different states in the United States. The highest one, like in New York City and California, the highest seroprevalence among general population up to 8%, still less than 10%. And there are some country in the European also observed uh, such higher seroprevalence among general population, but still less than 10%. So that means most uh, of the population in the world is still susceptible to the virus. As we all know, the vaccination not available so far. I don't believe the vaccination for most majority of the people in the world will be available in the next year, even in the next year. Maybe for some country like China and the US and the UK, maybe have a, be available in the half of the next year. So that means the virus still transmission again, epidemic will reoccurrence again, only depend on the human immunity and uh, control measure taking place in that country. Thank you, uh, Professor Yu. Um, we I thank again to our four speakers, Professor Hong Jae Yu from Fudan University, Professor uh, Matthias Irazava, 
Domingos from Ministry of Health, Chile, uh, Professor Martin Wong, and Professor Emily Chen from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Now we're going back uh, to take a break. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, going to uh, take a break, and we'll be back at uh, 55 a.m. Everybody will come back again. Just have a break. Thank you very much.